Good morning. So there is a wonderful quote from my uh, friend Julie Fredrickson that beautifully describes why everyone in this room needs to listen to our next guests. Quote, the most dreaded phrase in Silicon Valley is Balaji was right. In early 2020, Balaji Srinivasan was warning his followers about the potential impact of COVID when the credentialed experts of government and media were dismissing the virus as just the flu. Fast forward to March of this year, Balaji predicted that Bitcoin's price would rise to $1 million within 90 days. For those keeping score, that's June 17th of this year, less than two months from now. He predicted this would happen in response to an onset of hyperinflation, which might be easy to dismiss, except this man's putting his money where his mouth is. He's bet a million dollars worth of USDC on the outcome. Here to explain his thinking, please welcome angel investor, former CTO of Coinbase, former partner at A16Z, all-around intellectual gadfly, Mr. Crypto Tony Stark himself, Balaji Srinivasan. Hi, Mark, can you hear me? Thank you for being here, sir. So the question that's on everyone's mind is today, how are you feeling about that bet? So how do I think? Um, you know, actually, I have an update coming out on it, uh, but let me actually, you know, talk about timing and, and so on. Mm -hmm. um, April 10th, 2008, uh, a few weeks after a giant banking failure, Ben Bernanke got up and said uh, that we might be in for a mild recession. 158 days later, September 15, 2008, the world understood we were actually in the middle of a global financial crisis. And uh, about 15 years later, in March 2023, again, a giant banking failure that involved federal intervention. April 13th, 2023, Jerome Powell got up and said, hey, we might only be in for a mild recession. And I don't know how many days, months, years we have. Um, you know, if you think like a trader, you think, uh, you know, too early is the same as being wrong. If you think like a prepper, hell is truth seen too late. And so if you're trying to make upside, you have one set of things that you're doing. If you're trying to bound downside, well, it's better to be early. And, you know, just to quantify it, like what I think is, I think we have a 10% chance of a very serious issue in months, 70% in years, 19% decades, and like 1%, it takes like a century or so on. So I don't think it's 100%, mm -hmm. but even a 10% chance is, uh, you know, whether it's 90 days or the specific number, I'll get back to that in a second, but um, the specific number, you know, is, is high. That is to say, uh, I see a lot of fragility in the system. I see a lot of things which are literally walking like Wiley Coyote, you know, from <laughs> Looney Tunes. So there's like a cliff below, there's nothing there. There's nothing below it. Uh, you just heard some of that where people were talking about the extreme leverage of uh, many of these banks and how, you know, in the digital age, all the deposits can leave at once, but they only have six cents, 10 cents on the dollar. Um, and there's so many other crises at the same time. By the way, for what it's worth, uh, have you followed like the, uh, the whole debt ceiling thing? That's just yet another thing on top of this. Have you seen where uh, the markets are estimating the probability of US sovereign default? So if, if I'm hearing you correctly, it, yeah. it's, more of a, it's more of an insurance policy uh, than than a than a speculative bet is that is that a fair is that a fair fair way to put it? Yeah. So so actually, if you go back and look, right, and again, I've got an update coming out on this. Um, I actually set out to spend. A, I, I budgeted a million dollars to raise awareness of the fiat crisis, mm -hmm. and I started with like thousand dollar prizes for citizen journalism. And then there's a guy who said, "Oh, you know, you're so stupid. I'll bet you a million dollars that hyperinflation doesn't happen." And I thought about it and I was like, you know what? Okay, maybe I will take that, take that bet. I didn't propose it, I just accepted it. And I said, okay, maybe I'll take that just to get people to think about the, uh, you know, like people talk about X risk, you know, existential mm -hmm. risk, you yeah. know, whether it's uh, a pandemic, whether it's AI, okay. I think there's a pretty serious X risk for the financial system. 
Um, and I'm not the only one who thinks so. Uh, you know, Larry Summers, for example, has posted, you know, he thinks there's a two to 3% of a technical default within the next few months. Um, because, uh, you know, it's possible that this debt ceiling thing, you know, the, the pantomime becomes real. Markets have, um, last day checked, like 105 bips for U.S. sovereign default, which is like, you know, on the order of like 1%. So I'm not like 1,000x off from where other people are, actually. <laughs> That's the thing. The difference is, uh, you know, most people who have an estimate of the fragility of the system are just quietly exiting. They're just moving their money, they're getting offshore, they're going to wherever their safe place is. And I'm unusual in that I'm actually telling the public what I'm, what I'm seeing. Uh, and you know, one way of thinking about that is, how much advance warning in 2008 did you have as an individual? None, none, it was, uh, it was none, right? a black swan, as they say. Well, yeah, except you know, for the general public, they found out September 15, 2008, when suddenly we were in a financial crisis. But of course, we weren't suddenly in a financial crisis. It was suddenly acknowledged that we were in a financial crisis. This is not like a hurricane or a tornado. It's not like an act of nature where it just happens, right? In fact, Goldman in 2006 saw the writing on the wall and they acted early and started exiting their positions, right? So that's, you know, that's a Wall Street mentality. It's sell, then tell. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Right, so they, you know, they sell, they get out. If you seen, have you seen the movie Margin Call? It actually yes. depicts that behavior. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it's worth going back and rewatching all of those old financial crisis movies: Margin Call, The Big Short, Inside Job, Too Big to Fail. They all give it from kind of different perspectives, and they're flawed or whatever in their own way. But they kind of remind us of something that's about, just kind of slipped out of active memory, which is um, that the system that we still have, by the way. The system was set up to fake every indicator. For example, the mortgages were rated AAA, right? The toxic waste was considered super safe and everybody bought and sold that as if it was super safe and it wasn't, okay? And uh, those ratings only got updated after banks offloaded those things to, to less savvy people. The ratings agencies themselves, Moody's and S&P, why didn't they you know, reduce the ratings? Well, we actually got a clue of that a few years later in 2011 when the S&P downgraded U.S. debt. Do you remember what happened? Remind us. So the president of S&P was like forced to step down and the U.S. government launched an investigation into S&P because they downgraded U.S. debt around the last debt ceiling crisis. So the signal to everybody else was, okay, you know, let's not call anything into question. Right, and bringing, bringing, things to, um, bringing things back to, sorry, bringing things back to right now. If you're right, if you're right other than buy Bitcoin, what advice would you give people to manage the risk in case you're right, other than buying Bitcoin? Yeah, so here's the thing. Right, so, so the thing about that is, uh, you know, on, on Twitter, anything you say has to be like 10 words or something, you know, and it, it's, it gets reduced <laughs> to a fortune cookie, okay? I think the sophisticated version of how I'm thinking about this is, step one is to recognize that there is a problem, okay? Uh, and some people will not even admit there's a problem, but basically is the, is the building on fire? Okay, is there a burning building? Is there a digital fire that not everybody can see yet? Because you're in some other wing of the building. You're not actually looking at these charts showing the economy going into cardiac arrest, okay? So to speak, to mix metaphors, right? You're not seeing the smoke, you're not seeing the fire. So first question is, is this economy actually on fire? And the second question is, what do you do with that? Okay, so you can go to the fire escape, okay? You can go out the front door. Some person might go through a window or whatever, okay? And different tribes, will do different things. And one tribe certainly will buy Bitcoin. One tribe will buy Ethereum. One tribe will just, you know, buy gold or, or uh, you know, and, and another tribe, for example, a lot of Indians have just moved their money back to India, which for the first time in my life, I've never seen this before, but many founders that I know move their money back to Indian banks, uh, which I've never seen in my life, okay? And, um, so people are, uh, are, are basically, you know, whether it's gold, whether it's Bitcoin, whether it's crypto, whether it's something else, allocation is not 100% to Fed controlled accounts, okay? Meaning G7 banks, meaning any asset, for example, that was uh, like a Canadian trucker or a Russian, any asset that the Fed could seize or freeze, like a stock on DTCC or real estate in a blue state, anything like that, I would consider potentially at risk. Um, of course, none of this is financial advice, you know, like basically, I think if you divide it by tribe, 
you know, Blue Tribe will think you're, you know, basically totally crazy. Of course, you know, big banks are the best. You know, the U.S. has infinite hit points. Totally fine. Let them let them do their thing. Red Tribe will maybe buy gold or whatever. Bitcoin maximalists will buy Bitcoin. Uh, crypto and tech people will have some mix of them. And then most of the world, by the way, 96% of the world is not American. And 85% is uh, arguably not G7, depending on how you count. And those folks will just kind of trust their own local states. I'm not saying every single one of them is going to be good. In fact, number of sovereign defaults is rising very rapidly. But, uh, but basically, there's different options, right? So once you, so step A is, is there a problem? And then step B is, what is the solution? Bitcoin is one solution of them. I think by process of elimination, it's a, it's a good one. I can give logical reasons for that. But I recognize that not everybody is going to do that. Does that make sense? Yes. So, you know, a skeptic might say, you know, you know in crypto, we, uh, uh, we, we use the term FUD quite a bit uh, uh, in, res in response to, you know, you, know, you know, fear, uncertainty, and doubt, which means fear mongering. Um, a lot of people would say that Elizabeth Warren um, uh, played a role in the demise of Silvergate, um, uh, you know, by spreading a, a form of FUD. Um, is, what would you say to those who say that you're, you're FUDing the fiat system and that, that what you're doing is analogous to what Elizabeth, Elizabeth Warren did to, to Silvergate? My, my question is, why does Jerome Powell hate America so much? <laughs> okay, Jerome Powell. That's, that's my question is why, like, he must hate America so, so much because he has run the entire economy into the ground in a way that will be obvious to everybody. Uh, you know, fundamentally, um, what happened, and the reason I'm saying that is pointing out that the building is burning, pointing out that the pilot has crashed the plane, that the captain has crashed the ship, and that you might want to get to the parachutes or get to the lifeboats, that is not the same thing as being the pilot, right? Jerome Powell is the pilot. The pilot has crashed the plane. Okay. Uh, this uh, like I don't I, I don't make a habit. Look, I, I'm, you, you've known me for a while. I'm not John McAfee. I don't make a habit of you know causing crazy things. You know, like or whatever. I don't. I don't. I, I never talk price on Twitter. Okay. Even now, like, do I? It's it's really just a directional signal. Could it be that it takes you know 900 days? Could it be that it takes even 90 months? It's possible. As I said, I don't have a you know 100% probability on it. Um, is it is it possible that it's not like Bitcoin a million? Of course, you know, who, who the heck knows where the price actually goes? That just is like a symbol of collapse in the full faith and credit in the U.S. financial system. Where where things actually go after that, God only knows. Um, but but basically, some some guy on Twitter didn't cause that. The Fed caused it. And how the Fed caused it? I mean, it's a complicated thing. It's like the mortgage crisis in some ways, where there's a lot of complexity. There's also simplicity to it, which is. Just like in 2008, the thing everybody thought was safe, the mortgages, oh, obviously real estate is going to keep going up. Of course, it's the most American thing. Are you anti-American? Do you hate America saying real estate yeah. isn't going to go up? Oh, and wow. so everybody trusted that thing. It was like, it was like a political thing as, as well as a financial thing. Like the, both the Bush administration and others wanted people to buy you know, houses, et cetera. And then that whole thing unwound, the thing that they thought was the safest unwound. And something very similar has happened now. It is mortgage-backed securities. That's still a piece of it. But it's also treasuries. Treasuries are like the new toxic waste. Essentially, if in 2021 you bought huge amounts of treasuries from the federal government, you bought this asset, they turned around and did a surprise devaluation of it in 2022. And every to, bank, to be fair, that was not a credit devaluation. That was, an inter that was interest rate. That was due to interest rates yes. going up rather than to the, 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 the treasury defaulting, per se. Sure, sure. But, and, you know, and people like are really fixated. I, I, so it's yes, you're right, Mark. But people are really fixated on that. I'm like, does it matter why? I mean, like people treat interest rate risk, for example, as if it's like, again, a hurricane or a flash flood. Like interest rates are set by the Fed. The Fed is meeting, right? The Fed is coordinating with Treasury on all kinds of things, right? So one arm of the government is selling you this asset. And they're telling you inflation is transitory and we're not going to hike rates. November 3rd, 2021, Powell is still saying, getting up on stage saying, we're going to hike rates gradually, right? Then he gets renominated November 22nd, 2021. And then December 2021, surprise, fastest rate hikes, you know, in a, in a generation, maybe ever. And so everybody who binged on these bonds just a few months ago, first few weeks ago, is destroyed at the same time. And now how can they hedge? You know, okay, you can sell this your flaming bag of dog poop to the other guy, but the system as a whole is destroyed. And uh, so they tried, you know, all the banks tried various tricks. They tried, you know, hold to maturity accounting to pretend that, you know, maybe maybe the Fed is going to bail them out in the future and print some money, which would say did eventually. Um, 
but all basically the Fed surprised all the banks, all the institutions, everybody who bought bonds, everybody who thought that it was a safe thing to bet on the long-term financial probity of the U.S. government. Okay, they all got destroyed. Trust the Fed, end up dead. Okay, Fed lied, banks died. That's what happened. And uh, you know, to, to like one of the most insane things I've seen is people are like, oh, the tech guys made stupid bets, whatever. There's lots of stupid things tech guys have done. I, I mean, like all the censorship on Twitter, all of that stuff, you know, there's all, you know, whatever, you say, there's all the stuff, I'll, I'll, I'll agree, there's lots of stupid things tech guys did. In this particular case, it was just, you know, people just had deposits, checking accounts at, at SVB. It was, there's a, the, the reason, the way you can see that it wasn't a tech specific thing at SVB is first Yellen admitted it herself. She said it was interest rates that caused it, not, not tech. And second is, if it was a single bank problem, it might be a tech problem. But there's lots of banks that are floating up, you know, ending up dead, right? Yeah. It's a central bank problem. And, uh, you know, the way to understand this is that's why there's this, everybody is sweating bullets. All these bank stocks are getting downgraded. There's all these regional banks that are losing all of these deposits to the big banks. Everybody is wondering when the next, you know, run is going to happen. And, yeah, the Fed is committed to print to, to bail these things out. Um, but it's not just banks, by the way. It's just an auto loan crisis. There's a credit card crisis. Yes. There's uh, the student loan crisis. There's private equity. There's commercial real estate. Morgan yeah. Stanley, you know, you can Google this. Morgan Stanley thinks commercial real estate alone will be worse in 2008. So, and then, so of course, given, given, the, raw, conditions, given the conditions, given the conditions you're yeah. describing, um, I, I, I want to. I want to. We have a couple minutes left. Yeah. I, uh, yes. I want to talk yeah. about the network state concept. By the way, how many people here have read Balogh's sure. book? Pretty good. Pretty good show of hands here. Um, you've you've backed a bunch of network state projects. You've been keeping track of, of uh, the various network state projects uh, since since you put the concept out there, and, and, and we, we've seen some of these projects trying to make it a reality. What what have you learned so far? Good question. So one thing I want to say also, Mark, is I'm not a doomer. Okay, I'm 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 really not. I, I, I'm I, I, maybe I'm a doomer optimist in the sense that um, yeah I think unfortunately there's some bad things that are going to happen but I do think that if you're aware of them and you go into them with a sober mindset that you can make it out the other side survive and even thrive okay um, I, you know I, I, I'm happy to talk about the network state I, I, one thing I wanted to try to do I'm not pitching anything okay yeah. I'm literally doing what I think of as my duty as a citizen to tell you something that the corrupt media and banks and regulators and rating agencies are not doing. That's how I think about it. I may be wrong, but I'm burning a million to tell you they're printing trillions. That's how I'm thinking about it. That's why I'm like, you know, buy a Bitcoin, don't buy Bitcoin, read the network state, don't read. Like, that's all great stuff, okay? But that's like totally secondary to understanding that there's a, there's a digital fire burning. Um, with that said, you know, yeah, I do think like some subsets some tribes will decide to go to network state some other tribes and and you can read the book at the networkstate.com there's a bunch of projects on this right now it's basically rebuilding high trust societies from scratch um and uh, but others will go to red states others will go to purple states others will go to foreign states that's way easier frankly um and uh and, and so i think there's going to be a multiplicity of of answers to what comes one last thing i'll say is yep. de-dollarization is decentralization. It's not one reserve currency on the other side. It is something where, for example, the medium exchange rule gets taken, let's say, by, unfortunately, the digital yuan, but also the Indian rupee, the Brazilian real, uh, you know, various currencies, local currencies are being used. So medium exchange, the store of value gets taken by Bitcoin and gold and, and so on. The uh, Shanghai Gold Exchange, like the Chinese are actually using this. It is rumored that gold is, Luke Roman is big on this, that gold is actually a big part of some of these digital yuan deals. Um, and central, basically non-Western central banks are buying record amounts of gold, if you've seen that visual capitalist's graph on that. So that's me exchange at store value. Then like the financial system, again, that'll be RMB, INR, Ethereum, whatnot. Uh, as a system of control, something Andreas Antonopoulos talks about, that's a fundamental thing. Even in Indonesia, fourth largest country in the world by population, they're saying, we don't want Visa, we don't want MasterCard, we want our own homegrown uh, thing, and they're pushing that. And that's the thing. People are like, oh, everyone's talked about de-dollarization forever, it's never happening. This is being driven top down by more than 50 countries around the world at the same time. It is a 
it is not a market phenomenon. It's a political phenomenon that is happening at the same time this internal economic weakness is happening. So like looking at past stuff does not actually tell you about the seriousness of these other countries. What they, what they look at it as is a national security issue because uh, if they're on a dollar network, the U.S. can remote turn off their entire economy. So which they're moving a, to this. Which, and which that, is why, why that we're here. That's why we're building crypto, right? Is that, you know, That's you why we're building crypto, exactly. That's exactly. right. So the so point basically being is de-dollarization, decentralization, it's not one successor reserve currency. It's a multipolar world with many different things. And once you start thinking of the dollar not as a piece of paper, but as a network, well, there's a lot of different networks that can compete with some or all functions. There's a Bitcoin network, there's the Ethereum network, there's the Yuan network, there's the Rupee network, uh, there's the Brazilian Real, there's all of these smaller and larger kinds of things, both foreign currencies and cryptocurrencies, that can handle overlapping functions here. There's scaled payment apps in many countries like Brazil as PaySeguro, and there's like GrabPay in like Southeast Asia, and there's like Yandex Money in Russia, all those things. It's not that hard to like retrofit them and flip over. And the proof positive is, uh, you know, Russia basically managed to flip over completely to the yuan um, in, in like a year while it's fighting a war. And it hasn't actually totally collapsed like we, we thought it would. You know, obviously their invasion of Ukraine is completely unjustified. I'm just saying that they managed to switch over. They have a playbook for de-dollarizing in a hurry in a year without starving to death, without dying. Yeah, so it's possible. It's possible. And so the so point is, I think, yeah, I, I think basically once you think of the dollars network, not as just a money printer, not as just something that can easily be moved off of, but something that's like a social network, except it's got a big network, it's a financial network. There are alternative networks to it, and people are moving off of the dollar, both within the West to crypto and so on, and outside the West at the same time. Um, I haven't even got into the political issues like, you know, locally, yeah. like DeSantis being anti-CBDC and all the red states and purple states that are pro-Bitcoin or, or anti-CBDC. So there's a ton of different kinds of pressures on the U.S. establishment at the same time, the financial, the external, the internal. And I just, again, I don't know how long it takes, um, you know, the literal 90, 90 days, one million, like that's directional, right? It was 158 days for the economy to melt down after Bernanke said it was going to yeah. be a mild recession. Uh, I don't know how long it takes. Okay, I don't. For the, know exactly for the sake of the country, I do think for the sake of the country, yeah, I pray right. that you are wrong. Yeah. But I would not take the other side of that bet. Uh, thank you so much, Balaji. I'm afraid we're out of time, but I could I could keep going on for hours, but we we have to wrap it up. Uh, let's give a warm uh, round of applause, Balaji Srinivasan. Thank you, sir. Thanks and. Uh, Alrighty, so uh